Good morning, fellow stockholders, and welcome to Plus Therapeutics Annual Meeting. My name is Mark Hedrick, and I'm the President and CEO. This morning, I would like to go beyond the typical corporate presentation that we often give and provide an insider's look into important aspects of the company's drug development activities. Of course, during the presentation, please make note of our forward-looking statement language as part of my comments this morning. If you follow the company closely, you know that since 2019, we have enhanced our drug pipeline via three separate transactions and over time increasingly narrowed our clinical focus to central nervous system malignancies. In parallel, as our trials have progressed and more data obtained, we have gained increasing confidence that we can do something remarkable, specifically to soon transform these deadly brain cancers into chronic diseases that can be successfully managed with prolonged survivals. Our team has set this as our overarching corporate objective. Toward that objective, 2022 was a great year for the company, and here are a few highlights. We moved our lead drug for glioblastoma from phase one to phase two. We initiated a second trial in leptomeningeal metastases and were awarded a nearly $18 million grant to support the trial through phase two development, which equates to treating approximately 150 patients. We began manufacturing GMP drug for late stage trials and built out a resilient supply chain that can carry us into commercial production. And while we didn't initiate our planned pediatric brain cancer clinical trial, we had multiple constructive FDA interactions on the trial and are poised to initiate in 2023. We also in licensed the BAM drug platform for next generation radioembolic treatment of many cancers throughout the body. First, a bit of a deeper insight into how we view our target market opportunities. We intend to aggressively pursue and transform the treatment of highly lethal, unmet needs for central nervous system cancers. But besides this focus, obviously our drugs can address opportunities outside of the CNS, and those we will pursue ourselves when strategic to do so, or more likely partner those out. In aggregate, currently targeted market opportunities exceed $10 billion, and in the case of LM, are substantially underdiagnosed, perhaps as much as 75% underdiagnosed based on recent autopsy data, and therefore this opportunity could be actually much higher. A question we often hear is, hey, there are many isotopes out there. Why focus on rhenium as an isotope? Well, today, rhenium is not commonly used. However, I predict it will be ultimately in the future, and actually its chemistry is similar to technetium, which is its next door neighbor on the periodic table. And actually technetium is the most commonly used medical isotope by far. The bottom line is rhenium isotope is ideal for CNS indications. The energy mix of nine to one, beta to gamma energy, path link, decay time, chemistry, particle physics, and its versatility all make it ideal in our view. Furthermore, commonly used isotopes such as yttrium and lutetium have properties that undermine their effective use in the CNS or preclude loading into liposomes. But the supply chain production capability of rhenium will support robust commercial availability similar to these common isotopes. Thus far, we are developing two novel and versatile therapeutic formulations of rhenium, the 186 and the 188 isotope. These formulations are intentionally designed to leverage common medical procedures, such as 3D imaging techniques, stereotactic brain biopsy, and interventional radiology techniques to target a range of CNS and many other tumors. A key aspect of both drugs is that they are designed to stay where they are placed in the body, namely in and around the tumor until most, if not all of their radiation decay occurs. Practically, this means very high doses of the radiation for the tumor and little to no radiation to normal tissues, and therefore a very favorable safety profile 
is expected. In the year 2022, we made big strides in expanding our pipeline. For GBM, we bifurcated the RESPECT trial based on tumor size. In fact, this week, we announced that we completed the three required cohort eight patients in the phase one dose escalation team with the larger goal of pushing the envelope on the size of tumors that we can treat in a phase one. It's my view that we are likely very near the maximum volume and dose for a single administration in cohort eight. That is 16.3 milliliters and 41.5 millicuries of radiation, which is approximately two times the dose and volume we are giving in the phase two for small and medium sized tumors. Continued dose escalation helps both determine the maximum tumor sizes we can treat with a single administration but also informs the safety margin we can use to retreat patients when tumors reoccur. As to the phase two, it is enrolling nicely and we are expanding treatment sites and are ahead of our internal schedule to finish enrollment by the end of 2024. The next steps, whether to seek accelerated approval or phase three will be determined after review of the data and with further FDA discussions. Finally, we anticipate the pediatric trials for both ependymoma and high-grade glioma will begin enrollment this year pending FDA IND approval. Similar to the glioma trials, we are expanding the LM or leptomeningeal metastases trial to multiple indications or primary tumor types. We announced this week that we have completed enrollment in phase one, part A, without dose-limiting toxicities and plan to meet with the FDA and seek continued single dose expansion to determine the maximum tolerated single dose. In part B, we anticipate that we will narrow the LM patients to those with lung and breast primary cancers. Separately, we are also pursuing an additional clinical trial for patients with LM from a melanoma primary. Regarding our BAM drug, we met all of our milestones in 20. 22, culminating with successful internal drug manufacture and then use in an ex vivo perfusion kidney model. We are continuing preclinical development for liver cancers, but need the FDA to weigh in on the regulatory path. Namely, is it a device, drug, or combination product? Legacy non-resorbable products on the market are devices. However, we feel BAM is best regulated as a drug but the ultimate path will, will determine the preclinical uh, path going forward and the timeline to the clinic. The treatment approach for administration of rhenium obispameda and glioblastoma continues to improve and become more streamlined. Preoperative planning on the left panel occurs prior to admission in conjunction with our team and the treatment team. Then catheter placement of up to five catheters now, and typically three to four catheters occurs on the day of admission in the operating room, and then convection enhanced delivery occurs the day following surgery in nuclear medicine. We have confidence that in almost any glioblastoma situations, we can safely deliver the drug to the target, also called the region of interest, and administer over 100 gray of radiation. The evolving data set in the phase one and phase two remain consistent with past presentations. You have likely seen similar data uh, previously that are noted in this slide. Patients receiving greater than 100 gray absorbed tumor dose and tumor coverages of greater than 70% live longer than the best published data in recurrent GBM of about eight months median overall survival. Furthermore, Going beyond this 100 gray threshold initially observed in data presented at the Society for Neuro-Oncology meeting in November, there was a highly statistically significant correlation between both dose and tumor coverage to overall survival across all dosages. This type of a correla correlation at this early stage of development is highly unusual, but very promising. We can say at this point, 
that for each one, each 10% increase in the ratio of treated to total tumor volume, the risk of death decreases by about 67% with the p-value of 0.002. And for each 100 gray increase of total dose in the distribution volume, the risk of death decreases by about 46% with the p-value of 0.003. Additionally, besides pushing the envelope on tumor size in the phase one, we continue to push the envelope in terms of precision delivery to tumors. Some in very difficult anatomic locations, as in this patient with a deep brain recurrent GBM adjacent to the brain stem. In this patient, the tumor size was about 10 milliliters. And after treatment, the tumor coverage was about 95%, and the mean tumor dose was about 105 gray. And this patient remains alive at about 100 days post-treatment. This is the gamma imaging on the bottom left at 24 hours post-op and on spec CT showing the radiation, radiation distribution and then subsequent evolving tumor destruction on the MRI images to the right. These images taken at the same time show the radiation isobars and dosimetry to the tumor in three dimensions, extending for doses well over 100 gray centrally and out to about five gray, which are demarcated by the white line. We're increasingly seeing outcomes where we can deliver high doses of radiation and high percentage tumor coverage at the current doses. Now switching gears to leptomeningeal disease. As mentioned, we've completed the enrollment in the phase one part A of the LM or SPEC trial, and that's cohorts one through three, and we've done so without a dose limiting toxicity. CSF or cerebral spinal fluid distribution following the five minute outpatient procedure is rapid beginning immediately after injection. Currently eight of the initial nine patients from cohorts one through three remain alive. And in fact, one patient who received their initial therapy within the trial received a second dose under compassionate use guidelines outside of the trial. As to 2023 milestones, importantly, we intend to expand the GBM sites and enrollment such that we finalize phase two enrollment in 2024. We also intend to publish the respect phase one GBM data uh, in a peer reviewed publication and then present data from the ongoing respect GBM phase one and two trials in the second half of 2023. As mentioned, we completed phase one, part A of the RESPECT LM trial and plan an FDA meeting mid-year. And then we hope to begin the phase one, part B in the second half of the year. We also intend to expand the RESPECT LM clinical trial to multiple primary tumor types and then present data from the phase one, part A of the RESPECT LM trial in the second half of 2023. As mentioned, we intend, we intend to initiate the RESPECT PBC trial for pediatric patients with ependymoma and high-grade glioma, at first at a single site. We also will continue activities to expand our supply chain relationships and build in redundancy of that supply chain. We also intend to conduct preclinical evaluation of rhenium-186 obispameda with systemic therapies in development are currently available for leptomeningeal metastases. We also intend to finalize reg the regulatory designation for the 186 BAM technology and complete key development activities. And then finally, we will continue to submit multiple grants as we've done in the past and attempt to continue to raise non-dilutive capital to support pipeline expansion as we've done through our CEPRID grant for leptomeningeal metastases. To conclude, I want to thank you once again for joining us this morning, and we hope you will continue to follow our progress closely throughout the year. Also, I'd like to say that we, we often get informal referrals from patients 
and family members of, of patients with brain cancer. I would say, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or our team, and we'll do our best to help find them a good therapeutic match as most of these patients are treated within the context of a clinical trial, whether it's for our investigational drugs or other potential therapies. Once again, thank you and have a good morning.